um, that you're trying to um, determine what kids are learning and whether they're learning at a high level and then holding folks accountable for trying to get them to learn at a high level. I mean, we collect a lot of data now, a lot of places collect a lot of data and don't do much with it. We're trying to use data for information purposes uh, to drive change. So the place we started with accountability um, in the main is the principles. Uh, the principles are probably at the center of a majority of our reform efforts and certainly of the accountability efforts. The, the, the plan, you can go ahead, Mark, and see what's nice. Keep going. Um, the plan on principles is, is soup to nuts. I mean, it is to recruit, train, evaluate, and support principles and hold them accountable for academic achievement. And if you just look back a few years, um, principals were not necessarily trained to be instructional leaders. Um, in the old days, principals were managers. They were supposed to make sure the food was hot, the buses ran on time, etc. So the idea that a principal needs to be able to walk into a classroom and observe instruction and work with that teacher to make sure that instruction is of a high quality and is being absorbed by every student in the room is a relatively recent concept. It's certainly, unfortunately, a relatively recent concept to Pittsburgh. Um, so we had to start recognizing that when we got here, there was essentially no principal evaluation system. Um, there was no principal professional development system. It was probably, well, it was one of the weakest areas. So um, it may be the area that, that I'm proudest of in terms of where we have got. Um, I'm not going to necessarily follow uh, all that is here, but, but you can understand that if you're collecting data and if you're assessing how kids are doing, but you have no mechanism to hold anybody accountable for changing, then it's not a very worthwhile system. And I can promise you, as, as odd as it sounds, if you go to any system where all the adults in the system are happy and content, you've usually got a problem. Because there is a dynamic in a system in which, unfortunately, there needs to be the rub and grind of accountability, which is people being held responsible for whether things are working or not. Now, in the case of principles, you, you want it to be a little bit more complex and subtle than just um, a heavy-handed evaluation system. For one, really good principles don't lead with the concept that telling everybody what to do is leadership. They create a collective, collaborative sense of responsibility for student achievement in their schools, or what we in this business call professional learning communities. They have an instructional cabinet. All of our schools are supposed to have instructional cabinets. Some are very effective and meet often and do what we want them to do, which is wrestle with the results in the school, together, so collaboratively. What's the yes. instructional, instructional cabinet is actually in the contract uh, with the union and written in various other places in the district's agenda, but it includes a number of, I mean, it's different, in, it is not a prescription for what it must consist of, but it's teachers, assistant principal, counselor, social worker, and the principal. Um, some schools actually have instructional cabinets and additional forms of folks who sit and wrestle with the data, but most have just one. Um, and, and the point of it is to have collaborative leadership to solve the school's problems. And we know that schools that are successful in the main have that. There are some schools that are very successful that have a more dictatorial approach, but it doesn't tend to last as long or build the kind of culture in a school that delivers high student achievement over the long haul. So, um, the soup to nuts piece about the principles, and, and you know, you keep going because I'm not finding myself a thing. Well, there it is. Paul's Pittsburgh Urban Leadership System for Excellence. Um, a pipeline. You know, we have seen turnover in principles. Um, we wanted that. Uh, in the main, it has been good. Um, but it's one thing to have turnover, and it's another thing to have folks whom you're happy replacing principles with, right? So mostly, not totally, people won't move very far for a principalship. 
So mostly you have to build your own supply. So we created the Pella program, which um, is again funded by um, both federal dollars and Broad Foundation dollars. And it puts uh, aspiring principals who may or may not be assistant principals and who may or may not be yet certified because we've partnered with Duquesne in a certification program, um, but who go through a very rigorous, and it is very rigorous, application process uh, to be chosen for the program. Um, we had, I'm sorry, I'm going to blank on the numbers as to how many we had last year and how many we had this year. We have fewer this year uh, because we expect to have less principal turnover this year. Last year was our first year of evaluations and we had a reasonable number of um, demotions but also people who chose to leave of their own accord. Uh, we do not expect to have that, that many this year so we have a smaller class of Pella. Uh, I can tell you that our Pella principles that are in place now uh, are on the whole among our finest principles. Um, they are uh, not, of course, uh, consistent or exactly the same, but it's a really fine group. Um, lots of places will trump um, and, and claim that uh, merit-based compensation systems alone will produce what we want out of principles. I don't believe that. Um, I think the supposition, if you do believe that, is that principles are only motivated by monetary rewards, which I think is a false supposition. Uh, we believe that the merit pay system that we've evaluated I and mean, developed, which is basically based on student achievement and how the principles sell, uh, satisfy the rubric, work in collaboration with support and help. So working with the principals and working with an outside consultant, we did arrive at a rubric to judge principal performance. And satisfaction of that rubric is a part, not only of their compensation, but more importantly about what supports they get. So a principal um, may be very strong in some areas, uh, parent communication, and they may be strong in morale boosting and culture building, but they may be weak in data analysis and use of data analysis to drive change in the classroom. So the point isn't just to dock their pay or their bonus. The point is that they then get mentored and helped in the areas that they're weak. So it, it's built around the premise that people want to be good and that in the main, most of them can be good, but they probably haven't received the significant training that they need in certain areas. Now, there are some principles who just do not have either the capacity or the combination of capacity, energy, desire, and commitment to be effective school leaders. And those folks, we are going to move out. They don't have a business being school principals. But the point of the system is not just to move out the truly non-performers. It's to also build the capacities of other folks. And. Um, this all works together based on that premise. Um, and they do get a lot of help during this time. We now have four executive directors who oversee the 66 schools. Um, and all four of them uh, spend an enormous amount of time in schools. And we also now have these teaching and learning teams that also go to schools and work on evaluating and helping to further what is happening in the schools or not happening in the schools. Okay, I, I, I won't spend too much time on this, but um, there are a lot of changes in, in how we're doing it now. Much more extensive training and support, much more extensive mentoring, very intensive mentoring for principals in their first two years, by the way, what we call novice principals. There were all two categories of performance before, now they're for rudimentary, emerging, proficient, and accomplished. Um, but um, this system has actually now gotten a good amount of national notice, and we are being asked to go to other places and help other folks design and think about how to do this. So, okay, let's keep going. The, the point here is, as a district and as individual schools, we want a culture of accountability. Uh, we want folks at every school feeling 
mutually responsible for what's happening in that school and collectively responsible for analyzing it and figuring out where to go with it. And we want the district to be the same way. So it's about creating that culture of accountability. Okay, um, the evaluation tool. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on this because the words are kind of self-explanatory in terms of what rudimentary is, what emerging is, what proficient is, and what accomplished is. Um, there's a two-tier principle for principal compensation. Uh, no one gets a raise anymore at all for anything other than satisfying the rubric and student performance. The rubric piece is in their base pay. So it's up to $2,000 added to their base pay. The student achievement piece is a bonus. So it's something they get in the individual year, but it's not added to their base pay. Um, and these two systems work uh, together. Um, this is, at least at first, um, funded exclusively by the federal government. And by the way, one of the things we could talk to about tonight, if you're interested, is Obama's first education budget. Uh, and their commitment, by the way, which is interesting, to tying almost all of their discretionary funds to performance-based measures. Uh, they want performance-based standards for teachers as well. Um, they're tripling the TIF grant, which is the grant that we got the money for for this plan. Um, they're going to heavily invest in these kinds of activities. I think I've talked enough about that. I think we've talked enough about that. In, in the end, I mean, there are a lot of things that matter. Um, school culture matters. Parent engagement and whether the school is welcoming to parents matter. Um, all of these things matter. But in the end, we have to recognize that student achievement is that which matters most. So it does in the end come down to better student outcomes. This is just a little data on in the first year. Um, Every principal had positive growth in at least one subject. Eighty-two percent of all principals were eligible for one quarter of the bonds. What is SP1? School Performance Index. Is that what Rand did? With that is what Rand helped with, yeah. So does that mean that you're doing it again? We do a piece of it every year, yeah. And again, that piece is wound into how the student, how the principal's bonus is arrived at. And by the way, what this does do is it builds a, um, a platform if, over time, uh, we can move the teachers into the same system. Because now we have an arrived at rubric, which has been tested a little bit on, on how to rate schools in an equitable manner for performance. Is that data the, not the principal evaluation piece of the data, because that's private in their personnel files, but the school data is, yeah. We can keep going. I... Yeah, just keep, let's just get to a lot of information. Okay, okay teachers. teachers. Um, and we can... Yeah? Sorry, can I just one about Please. Yeah? Yeah, it's principals like now have a, a minimal percentage of time that they're expected to be in the classroom, and their executive director communicates with them about that. Yeah. And is it a quarter? Is it a? Um, honestly, I don't remember exactly what it is, um, but it's at least a quarter. Yeah. Just as executive directors now must be in schools, sixty percent of their time. Right. And we have obligated ourselves not to have any central office meetings Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday that they would be. Uh, uh, expected to attend so that they can be in schools. So my question goes back to this A-plus conference they did years ago where they brought gentlemen, I can't remember, who talked about this whole idea of instructional time and helping teachers. And I was just wondering, are we at, is it, are principals are spending a lot of time learning to be better principals? So at some point, that time will be spent in the classroom more? No, I think right now they're in the class. I mean, it, it, yeah, I mean, 
first of all, principles should always be in an ongoing learning process, right? We all should be. Uh, and we all in central office have coaches, by the way, um, who work with us on our performance. Everybody does um, in the instructional side of the house. So, you know, the professional development and their training should be a constant in their um, professional lives. Um, and so should time in the classroom be. Now, some principals were not that comfortable in that role. And um, some of them have, have, have chosen to move on. Um, and to, in fairness to them, it was not a clear expectation um, formally. And they were not necessarily trained for it, as I mentioned. So it's just part of an overall culture change. Yes? Is it a, every school, the principal needs to be in there the same amount of time, or depending on the needs of the school? Like, the principals have a minimum amount of time, minimum yeah. amount of time that they're expected to be in the classroom. And I think in the individual plans they work out with their executive director, depending on the school situation, that minimum time is probably expanded, but it's never made less than. So 20, approximately 25 Yeah, and I apologize, I did not. Um, we had a, a, today was a very emotional and large day, and I didn't have time to reacquaint myself with all the particulars before coming over. I guess my question is just, schools are different, so even though there would be a minimum for all principals, as the needs of the schools are different, there's not a standard that it has to be this, even though your school might have a stronger need in this area. There's, no, there's nothing that could absolve principals of the responsibility to be observing classroom instruction, no matter how high-flying a school is or how low-flying a school is. But I've been on several of the teaching and learning walks this year, um, and you know that is a new, that is a, an example of deepening the work this year. Um, the, the amount of focus that there is now on this is a huge shift, and you can, you, can, you can tell in a school very quickly when you're walking in with a principal how comfortable they are being in the classroom and, and whether they're comfortable with that part of their, their work or not. Yeah? Um, first of all, I want to say thank you for the clearing of principals who were in effect. I've been around a long time, and those of us who've been around a long time had the saying that passed the lemons. If you were lucky enough, not to get somebody who was moved out of the building because they were ineffective. But my question is, um, with the Pella people last year, I believe there was nine or ten. I think, were, I think nine it was nine. Nine or ten. I yeah. think it started ten and they went to nine. Yeah. And there's less this year. Yeah. Um, why? There's going to be principals who are going to need to move on. We can't think that there won't be. And if we don't have people ready to step up, then we're going to be in the same boat that we There will not be as many this year. There will not be as many openings. Is it a funding is issue, or no. is it people didn't apply? Oh, no. Oh, man, we got tons of applications. Um, by the way, just to give you an example, I was just looking. We got 520 teacher applications for the Science and Technology School for 30-some positions, 75% of which were from outside the district, private schools, parochial schools, charter schools. You know, there's a desperate want on the part of professionals in public schools to be part of innovation and excitement. But over the last two years, we've had a lot of turnover in the principal court. A lot. I can't give you the exact number, but about 40% of our principals are new since I've been here. You expect that and actually should want that to go down a bit as time goes on. And we do expect, and we have reason to expect, that it will go down this year. One, we track how many, how many principals are at retirement years who have vested fully in the pension system. And that leads us to know, or to at least suspect, how many will voluntarily leave the system. And in the second year of evaluation, you could expect, even though it's not necessarily so, that there would be fewer principals who were being rated um, lacking the full capacity to do the job. Yeah? Um, as far as the principal, I don't want to harp on this principals in the classroom thing, but is that something that's reportable? to, say, the PSCC or the PTO group? I mean, can we ask um, how much time you're spending in the classroom on what sort of activities? That's a perfectly reasonable question to ask your principal, absolutely. Just say you want to understand how much time do you spend observing instruction and, and what do you find? What do you find? 
I mean, that's, that's a totally legitimate question to ask. I wouldn't ask it in a compliance-oriented way. I would ask it in a mode of inquiry way, right? Because that's a very, it's a very useful question to know the answer to. Yeah. A number of principles uh, left last year. How many principles from the Pulse program are in our system now? I believe that I know that there's one of the polls candidates who is a math supervisor in central office. So I think eight of the nine are in schools. Uh, one, Ruthie Ray, was out on maternity leave, but she's gone back to Arsenal Elementary. So I think it's eight of the nine are as principals in schools. And one of the reasons, by the way, we decreased the number this year by the by the mode of the agreement, we need to place, I think, 75% of them in a year as principals. That's part of the agreement we made because people didn't want to fund a program and just have us place people in other positions. So that's why we need to be careful about the size of the program, or one of the reasons we need to. Yeah? How do you determine which principals are going to be mentored by the payroll residents? Um, that's a, that's, the question uh, was, how do we determine who gets to be the mentor principals? First of all, they've got to want to be. Second of all, they've got to be judged as being high-performing principals. Now, um, that's been a little tough with our principals association. They think that we should be, um, have different criteria for that, because there is a little bit of extra money involved, but that is, that is our, our criteria. I, I, you know, again, I'm in an excellent frame of mind today. I have to tell you that, for those, how many of you were actually, who worked for us, were at the professional development today? Um, it, it was, it, it just wasn't my favorite day so far since I've been in the district. It was very close to it. But my other favorite day <clears throat> since I've been here uh, was the Pella graduation ceremony last year. It was just unbelievably moving, the bonds that had formed between the mentors and the Pella folks and the aspirations that the Pella folks were able to articulate uh, for their own career as principals. It was a, it was a beautiful, beautiful evening. So uh, I think it's a very, a very healthy thing. Anything else on principles before we, we go to teachers? And we can come back to it um, after we're done. Yeah? Are you going to be 